Thank you, everybody, um, for sticking out to this very last session. So uh, obviously, I, all of us want to probably get going and eat whatever snacks they have out there after a break. I, I did discover coffee, so I, I'm in a little bit better shape than, than Hadrian was, because I actually have my cup there. But um, So might as well kind of get started. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, integrating web services and the various options that we have for web services uh, within CAMEL. Um, so uh, for a quick agenda, uh, we're going to have a little introduction about what I'm going to be talking about, who I am, stuff like that, uh, and then start talking about the various options you have within CAMEL for doing web, web services. In, in CAMEL, there's, there's a bunch of different ways, and as we saw from, from Christian's uh, talk this morning, uh, CAMEL has this like viewpoint uh, of why have one way of doing things when you can have five ways of doing things. Um, and uh, that's fundamentally, so when you start digging into CAMEL and, and you're like, okay, how do I need to do this? You suddenly see like six different ways of doing things. Web services is no exception. There's a bunch of different ways of doing different things. Uh, there's pros and cons and stuff, and uh, we're going to kind of go through uh, the various options that we have in CAMEL uh, and, and discuss some of them. So, who am I? Um, I'm employed by Talend. I'm the VP of Open Source Development. I have a team of people that kind of concentrate on doing stuff at Apache, uh, whether it's CXF or, or CARAF or whatever. Uh, and I've been doing this SOAS stuff for many, many years. Um, uh, I kind of feel like I'm like an old fart in this whole space type thing, but <laughs> I, I, I guess I actually am because I, I, I've been dealing with, with uh, a lot of the soap related stuff back when they originally even started just doing soap stuff and uh, all of your RPC encoded stuff was the, the big thing and which nobody does anymore, um, thankfully. So I've been, been around for doing this for, for a long time. Um, I've been with Apache uh, for a very long time as well. Uh, I was involved in bringing CXF into the incubator. I'm currently the PMC chair there, uh, but I've also gotten involved with a lot of other projects at Apache. So there's a whole list there. I have like thousands and thousands of commits and all these various projects. And um, I am an ASF member. Uh, that's also a kind of one of those like proud moment type things uh, of uh, being recognized for everything that I've done for Apache. I also have served on the Apache board in the past, and so I, I've been very involved with Apache. So. That's who I am. Um, I said, uh, somebody once told me that, that uh, if you, you can't have a talk without saying something controversial so that people remember it. Um, so I'm going to say something controversial right now. Go Pats. See, that's the, my, my personal note and a controversial note all in one. So everybody will remember this now. Um, all right. So when we talk about web services, uh, there. Traditionally, like five years ago, when you talk to web services, it was always going to be some sort of SOAP-based service. Uh, you're going to be dealing with SOAP 1.1 or 1.2. You may have some of those WS star-related specs, WS addressing, WSRM, WS uh, security. All those things would accomplish what you have web services. Now, over the last few years, we've, we've seen uh, a lot more traction around web services based on REST. Uh, and uh, for the purpose of my talk, I'm going to include all of that stuff because for, for fundamentally when we're talking about web services uh, for what we're doing nowadays, it's data or requests and, and information kind of coming, being transported over your standard web-based protocols, which should basically be HTTP and HTTPS. Um, to some extent, as we're moving forward with some of the new protocols with, with uh, like the, the Spidey stuff and the web sockets and things like that, I mean, the definition of web service is going to evolve with those standards. Uh, we've, we've seen the, web, the definition kind of change over the last few years from, from pure soap to including the rest things and stuff like that, and it will continue to evolve. It's not like it's going to be set in stone as of what this is. Um, and like I said, there's all kinds of options about web services in CAMEL, and we're going to discuss, discuss some of that. Um, in CAMEL, if you're doing web services, one of the things that I usually strongly suggest for people is to think about them from a very low level standpoint. Uh, most of your web services use cases when you're dealing with CAMEL uh, can be done without things like CXF. I know we'll talk about CXF a little bit later. Uh, CXF is what I would consider a full featured web service technology for, to, to work with CAMEL. But a very large percentage of your integration problems with CAMEL that you're dealing with with web services can be done without CXF. 
uh, and it would probably perform better without CXF. Uh, CXF has a lot of functionality. It does a lot of really cool things, it, uh, but it can, it's also lots of times overkill for what you need to do. Um, so fundamentally, when you're dealing with web services in your route, you're going to have some information coming in. You may do something a little bit with that information, and then you're going to send it off to someplace else. Um, and that whole middle section of actually doing something with that information, that's completely optional. You may not. I mean, it, it, one of the common use cases for, for, for CAMEL with web services is just a straight proxy. You bring up a service on a port or something like that, the requests come into there, and it goes immediately out to another service. You don't even really look at the payloads. Um, I, and I've seen a lot of people do, do just simple things like that. And for something like that, I mean, why use CXF? We have a lot of good components for that. And I'll show you a little bit of that in a second. Um, when you're dealing with these low-level integrations, uh, again, they're, uh, they're mostly uh, payload agnostic because you're basically just dealing with the streams, uh, the streams of bytes uh, as the information's coming in. Um, that, that's kind of important because when you're dealing with streams in CAMEL, uh, by default with, with, with CAMEL and well, with streams in general, is if you read the bytes from them for some reason, for whatever purpose, those bytes are gone. They're consumed. So if you have the next component that's, like if you don't do something to save those bytes, and you, the, you go to the next part of your route, well, those bytes are gone. So you need to be aware when you're dealing with streams in, in CAMEL that um, if you need to pass those bytes from, from stream to stream or from component to component, you have to like enable the stream caching or uh, convert those payloads to strings. Or, uh, and there's a bunch of different options for, for what you may want to do with that. Uh, but because they are stream-based, it is something that, that you have to be aware of when you're dealing with, with these types of things in CAMEL. Um, there are the two categories of components uh, that you're going to have to deal with when you're dealing with WebServe. So you have your, your consumers, um, and then you also have your producers. There's a lot of components like CXF and Jetty that provide both consumers and producers uh, in the same type of configuration syntax and stuff. Others are not. So again, if, if you're a little bit confused about what you need to do, I you go off to the CAMEL website. There's a nice little components link on the right. There's the whole list of 120 of them, and you can kind of dig through. They're, they're for the most part, fairly well documented, and I definitely uh, encourage people to if you're looking at these components, read through the documentation. If you see something confusing in the documentation, help us out um, and, and kind of give us patches or comments or anything like that. Um, all right, so the low-level endpoints are, are consumers. Uh, we pretty much have two of them that you're going to be dealing with within CAMEL. Uh, the first one is the CAMEL servlet, uh, and the second one would be the, the CAMEL jetty. The, for the most part, they're the, they're the same thing. just depends on, on what your entry point is into CAMEL. Uh, with Camel Servlet, you're going to have a, it, more useful for when you're deploying into things like Tomcat or WebLogic or, or some sort of app server that is providing an HTTP stack for you. Uh, in that case, when you deploy your, your, uh, your route, your starting point is going to be uh, basically just a context. So like in this case, it would be slash foo. So, so things coming in on that servlet with slash foo will, start, will trigger the start uh, of that route. Um, with Jetty, uh, is a little bit different in that uh, it's roughly the same thing, but rather than using your, your, serv your server container that's already there, it will bring up a Jetty instance on whatever port you have configured there. So this will actually bring up a, an embedded Jetty on the local host 8080 port, uh, and we'll use that as the, the starting point for your, your routes. Um, really, that's, that's the, the only main difference, that, and they're both going to obviously provide uh, HTTP headers and, and to the route, and the, the body is going to come in as a string. And they're pretty much the same idea. It's just a matter of what is your starting point. Um, uh, the Jetty stuff, uh, I, one of the things that they didn't really cover too much this morning in the other talks was, was everything in Camel. if you don't know about it, you have these, the, the URIs. So there's a lot of like question mark config config things that you could tack on to these things as far as like Jetty you can have like configure some of the thread pool things and stuff like that if you wanted to. Um, but for the most part if you just want very simple like okay, get something up and running that would be enough to actually do it. Um, and the other thing to, to note you have XML DSL and Java DSL. I'm going to flip back and forth between them because it just happened to be whatever example I was copying off of the web pages or out of the unit tests or, or depending on where I was finding examples. 
uh, they may be one or the, the other. All right, for the low level producers, we actually, there's a bunch of them. Um, they're, all four of them pretty much work the same way. They're gonna take uh, a payload of bytes and send them off to whatever the web server is. And we have, these are the four main ones that I found while I was looking through the whole list of 120. There's probably others there. Um, <laughs> but for the most part, we have, we have the, the Camel HTTP, which is badly named, because uh, it probably should have been like an HTTP 3, because it's based on the Apache HTTP client 3.x. Um, we're gonna have to have a discussion about that one as to whether we keep that one going forward due to uh, the Apache HTTP client 3.x no longer being supported and having support issues and security issues and things like that. So going into Camel 3 and those discussions, that's one of the things that we're gonna have to, to talk about. Now, uh, it may be replaced with another, like the, the HTTP 4 may be alias to HTTP 3, so that you can, any of your existing URLs will still work, but there's still a lot of discussions that, but uh, so that's one option. We have the HTTP 4, uh, the AHC, the, the async HTTP client um, based producer, and we also have Jetty. Uh, there's a Jetty client API now that you can kind of use to make calls. And so one of the, I mean, fundamentally all four of them pretty much do the same thing. So why would you choose one over another? Um, again, it's really up to you. Uh, one of the things about Camel is they don't like to restrict your, your technology choices in a lot of cases. So if you have an application that's already using uh, the HTTP 4 libraries for something, uh, then it may make sense to use the Camel HTTP 4 because you already have the dependencies in your uh, class path. So you, why add yet another one? Uh, likewise, if you're using Jetty, um, you already have the Jetty libraries there, so you could use the, the Jetty client as well. So a lot of this is just uh, kind of take a look at your dependency trees, what jars do you want to bring in, uh, what mat matches what you're already doing. Uh, it also can kind of come down to testing your, uh, your routes and your payloads with each of them. Uh, as we saw from Christian's presentation this morning, I mean, there's different options may perform differently. Uh, the, like the async client, HTTP client one, uh, it's likely slower uh, because it's based on the NIO stuff, so, so it might be a little bit slower than the others, but because it's async in nature, if, it, if you're dealing with a, if the server on the other side of the connection is a slow server and it's not gonna respond for five seconds, 10 seconds, that may be a better option because it wouldn't be consuming threads where the other ones are all uh, blocking based. Like if you issue a request, it's gonna block that thread until a, re a response comes back. So uh, again, you kind of have to weigh some of these situations to figure out which is the one, which was gonna best work for your, uh, your application. So just to give a quick couple of examples. Um, the first one up there, as I mentioned, is your basic proxy. Uh, it's gonna come in on Jetty and it's gonna go right out to the real server. Uh, we're not gonna touch the payload, the bytes are gonna come in, we're gonna feed, send them right out. We're not gonna really do anything with it. Um, very simple. Uh, the second one is basically the same thing, uh, other than we're going to stick an XSL transformation in the middle. So uh, as the information comes in, we'll run this XSL transformation on it, and then the bytes will, the result of that will then go off to the real server, and then whatever it responds with back will come back. So, relatively simple, I mean, you're, again, this still kind of fits into our definition of web service, but we're not dealing with, so, I mean, this, these things could be SOAP, um, it could be just pure XML on a REST thing, uh, and the first one, it could basically even be JSON or anything, you're not even it, looking at the payload, it, it, I mean, the, the second example there, because it is an XSL transform, it's going to expect it to be XML fundamental. And if you don't, if you try sending a JSON to it, it'll barf because it's not your. You can't really do a, an XSL transform on the on the JSON. But um, that's part of what the whole web service is kind of defining what the data you're expecting and, and doing the right thing with it. Um, and then as we as we saw for this morning with. Uh, Christian's thing, we, you can also do things like, like uh, X queries. Uh, this is where I want to point out, we have the stream crash equals true added to the route. Um, one of the things that X query will do is it will consume the bytes off the stream uh, to obviously run the, the X query on it. So 
if you don't cache the stream as it's reading to figure out if it's supposed to trigger this, this choice, uh, those bytes will be disappeared. And then the, the, when it does the, the two, it's okay. If, if the element is in the first, like, I don't know, like 10% of the message, the only, wherever it's gonna go from that point on may actually go off to the server and the whole first chunk, because we consumed it, is, is gone. So if we don't do some caching, uh, you can kind of get some funny things where, where you're, you're sending like partial messages off to the server, uh, and uh, that's one of those kind of like support things that, where people would ask on the forums, like, hey, why is my server only getting half a message? Um, and it's like, well, are you doing something with the stream? And like, well, yeah, I guess. Um, and that, that's fun. Like, a lot of these camel components, if you feed them a stream, they may eat a little bit. One option, like I said, I mentioned before, if you know all the messages that are coming in are relatively small, rather than uh, doing the stream caching, you could convert them to a string. Or if you know it's XML, you can do a convert it to a DOM. Uh, strings and DOMs and, and things like that are uh, reconstitutable. You can actually iterate over them multiple times and stuff. So, but of course, when you start doing that, you have to deal with the memory implications, and you have to know that okay, the, you're only going to get the, getting small messages in, which uh, I wouldn't usually count on that if you're dealing with an internet like exposed type thing because messages could come in from some attacker and they may know that you're only only expecting a 10k message and they'll send you a two meg bot, uh, or two meg uh, message and you're going to parse it and then it just blows up and stuff so definitely kind of think about these things as you're as you're designing these uh, the nice thing about the stream caching in camel if you're not aware I mean, if it exceeds a certain size it will get dumped on a disk uh, if, if it has to um, to keep the memory usage down. Obviously, then you have your disk store may fill up and there's, there's issues around that. And uh, with 2.11, they've at, we've added the ability to actually encrypt those things that are stored on disk. So if you have certain security requirements about anything that's written out to, to persistent storage has to be encrypted in some sort of algorithms, there's options for that now. Um, so obviously, there's a performance impact and all that stuff too, but I mean, there's there are options there. Now, when you're dealing with the low-level things, like I said, you're just dealing with streams, some of them is not the most convenient thing to do. So if you're dealing with, say, JAXB objects, or uh, JAXB objects are the easy ones to, to talk about, um, and you want to send like a JAXB object to a service that's expecting a SOAP thing, uh, we have this camel SOAP uh, component. It's actually really a, more of a data, data binding? Um, yeah, data binding, that, or data format, that's it. Data, data binding in CXF, data format in, in Camel. Um, that kind of makes generating a SOAP message for these low-level things very easy. You can basically, what it, it'll basically do is, uh, in this route that you see at the bottom, the, the direct, marshal, and then two, what it'll do is, if you send a JAXB object to that direct uh, endpoint, it'll pass it into the SOAP data format, which will then kind of wrapper it with some Jax B uh, things that represent the SOAP envelope and the SOAP headers, and it'll pull headers out of the, the message and stuff, and then write that to uh, a byte array, and then forward that onto the service. So it basically just helps, helps you make the uh, stream of bytes for SOAP uh, a little bit easier. Uh, so instead of having to, to do a lot of it yourself, then, that, then again, if you're gonna do that, you might as well just use CXF or Spring WS, which we'll cover in a minute. Is, is this component uh, open source? This is all part of, all, everything I'm talking about here is, is, part, is part of Camel. Um, yeah, so if you, if you go to the, if you do an SVN checkout of Camel, it's there uh, someplace um, in that 100 and some components that are in the components directory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of one of those weird name things because it's, it, is, it isn't really a component, so you won't see it on the component page. Uh, it's a data format, so it would be off on the data format pages. Uh, now, the one thing to be careful about with this, um, I discovered this while I was testing this and preparing for this slide, uh, was the marshal and unmarshal methods inside a camel use a byte array output stream, not a cached output stream. So if the size of your, mess of your JAXB objects is huge, it will consume memory. Um, 
Right? We were having a bet with Hadrian as to whether like Christian or Ben or somebody's going to be have this fixed by the time I end my presentation or not. Um, but <laughs> um, it, it is something that I, I did know. So any of the existing versions of, of Camel, um, it, it would consume a little bit of memory. Uh, it is something that I now know about, and, and we'll probably get that fixed as we, as I saw that. Um, not a huge deal, but something to be aware of. Uh, then beyond those kind of low-level things is when we start getting into the more full-featured. Uh, when I talk about full-featured web service things, uh, they provide more than just like byte handling. Um, and most of these cases, they will like either take your JAXB objects or your XML and handle the the wrappering, like creating the SOAP envelope and the SOAP header and the SOAP body wrapper elements. Uh, they handle thing, some of the extra WS star protocols like WS addressing and, and things like that. Uh, once you start getting into to your more complicated SOAP cases, these things make life quite a bit easier. Uh, for, I mean, if you have requirements for like WS security based requirements, you're not going to want to be programming those yourself. I mean, uh, take it from me, we've been doing these things for, for a year, like Calm and I have been doing security stuff for years and it's still not working completely well and right. <laughs> We're constantly making fixes and stuff. So it's not something you want to tackle yourself. And this is where you, having having these full full based full featured uh, options available to you uh, makes it a little bit more valuable. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is is the Spring Web Services component. Um, again, it pretty much will take your your XML coming in, uh, do the wrapping, send it off. Likewise, it is a it's both a consumer and a producer. So on the consumer side, you can uh, expose like create web services uh, that will, depending on the mappings that you choose, will then go into whatever processor that you, you want it to do or, or trigger another route or something like that. So you can kind of see, eh, little, font's a little small over there. Um, the top one here is a, your simple sam uh, sample of a producer where if you send some XML into the direct example um, route as a starting point, uh, Spring Web Services would wrapper that in a SOAP message and send it off to foo.com slash bar. Uh, there, again, it's camel. There's a whole bunch of question mark parameter things on the Spring URLs that you can say, uh, send in a SOAP action of whatever. Uh, this is, we want WS addressing enabled, so because Spring can handle WS addressing. Uh, so it'll add the addressing head headers and, and handle a lot of that response, uh, or a lot of the SOAP things that, that you just don't want to deal with. Uh, on the consumer side, uh, Spring has some really nice uh, capability of uh, in their, I want to say like servlet or endpoint mapping thing where you can kind of specify uh, a bunch of rules that say, okay, if the data coming in meets, meets these patterns, it would go off to, it would trigger a start of this route. Um, for CXF, it's generally like a, you have a URL that will, the URL itself is the only thing that really will, will trigger your start of your route or like in a pure CXF case, it's your endpoint. Uh, with Spring, it, there's a lot more flexibility. So the, the, top, the top one here, uh, you're basically telling Spring uh, when anything comes into your servlet that has the, the root queue name in the body, uh, not the, like it, after you've done the SOAP envelope and body uh, processing, if the root queue name is this get foo, uh, then we're going to go off and start this route. Otherwise, if it matches this XPath expression uh, with a whole big long thing, uh, then we're going to start this route. So Spring actually gives you kind of some neat flexibility as far as being able to have like just one thing kind of deployed and it kind of will like flow out of there into a bunch of routes. Now that said, even on the CXF side, um, you could have one URL and then do a s switch on X queries or, or, or a choice on X queries and do roughly the same thing. You just kind of take the payloads and pass them on to the next, to another route anyway. So uh, it just, where is that kind of configuration done? Is it in routes or as part of these URLs for Spring? Um, don't know. Um, and then we get into the uh, Apache CXF based component. Um, uh, like I said earlier, in most, in a lot of cases, CXF component is probably overkill for what you're going to need, unless you need specific things like the WS 
security things, WSRM, WS policy, all of those things, I mean, CXF can handle those very well. Uh, CXF component has different options for, for what gets passed from CXF to the route. Uh, I'm going to cover those four in a minute. Uh, Christian kind of touched on them very briefly this morning, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit more in, in depth about those. Uh, obviously, with, with CXF, you're dealing with Jack Swizz, uh, so you, if you have an endpoint that has annotations and stuff, I mean, CXF's job it will actually take that, those classes and interfaces and stuff and create Jack B context for the, for the POJO models and generate the WSDLs that would get returned if somebody asks for a WSDL. Uh, I mean, obviously, like your route, you're not going to be dealing with the WSDLs or anything like that. You're just going to take the, the information coming in and, and respond. Uh, but for a, pure, for a true web service, you're going to want to have a WSDL exposed for the, the users to be able to use. So again, CXF can, can handle that very well based on Java first scenarios with JaxWiz, or even if you want to start with a WSDL and gener generate code, or even not generate code with, with Camel. Um, and the, the big thing about the, the Camel CXF component uh, in Camel, it really does expose pretty much the entire functionality of CXF to a Camel user. Uh, and that's important. I mean, it, CXF has touch points like through the interceptor chain, through the various uh, list, endpoint listeners, bus listeners, things like that. So if, if you need to do some custom functionality uh, in your processing, uh, all of those touch points that CXF has are exposed to uh, the Camel people. And so if you are familiar with CXF and you, you may have applications that are already using some of these things, using those with Camel is relatively uh, simple. Uh, you can kind of get them all kind of working and, and for the most part. However, and this is the, probably my biggest complaint about the CXF component in Camel, it's kind of complex to configure because there's a lot of options. Most of your other components you can do fairly well just by um, modifying the URI string uh, when you, as a starting route, like you saw two HTTP colon whatever, whatever. Uh, you can do that with CXF, but because there's all these configuration options, um, your string, your URI string can kind of go like from here to the wall or something like that. It, it's really bad. I mean, it's not so bad, not so bad in the Java DSL where you can at least uh, do like, close a string and then open it, like do the plus and then open it on the next line and so you can kind of make it multiply. But when you're dealing with the, with XML where your string is basically the contents of the element, it can kind of make your XML just kind of like scroll and scroll and scroll. So uh, for in the XML stuff then we, to, to kind of combat that we actually created uh, separate like uh, CXF endpoint elements and then you can refer to those in your URL. So instead of doing, C, uh, CXF colon HTTP whatever you can do CXF bean and refer to one of the other beans for configuration. So like I said, there's a lot of power there, but it does complicate your configuration a bit. Um, so there's the kind of the, the example of uh, like the, the various endpoints that you have with, with CXF and you can kind of see on you're dealing with uh, WSDLs and namespaces and queue names and service classes and, and all these kind of stuff, which if you try to throw them all on a single URL line, it would get long. Um, and these are actually simple use, this is simple stuff. Uh, if you start having to like add in interceptors, uh, the CXF endpoint element actually has a CXF colon interceptors, or in interceptors and out interceptors, they're separate, depending on where you want the interceptors. There are child elements for handling adding interceptors into there. Uh, if you need to add CXF features, same way, uh, endpoint properties. Uh, that's a big one because things like WS security with, with uh, CXF, the security policy requirements that you have to pass in uh, class names for your uh, password uh, validators and uh, your key, where the locations of your key stores for your uh, various keys and things like that. Those are all properties in CXF. So if you, again, you can do like question mark, I think it's, CXF properties equals and then some name value things on the URL. You just don't want to do that though. I, it's, it can get very complicated, which is why if you, if you can kind of go this route, you can have, there's child elements for all the various CXF things that, that you, you may need. Again, it's a little complicated from a configuration standpoint. Um, definitely kind of open to ideas for, for how to, to 
address some of that, specifically for CAMEL 3, where we can have the opportunity to, to kind of rethink some of this. So if anybody has some ideas, we're definitely open for, for some of I mean, It's one of those things where CXF has a lot of power, and like, how do you expose that in some way that's convenient? And, and I, it, there's a balance there that, that we're trying to achieve. Um, so this, again, is basically just a simple route of what comes in on the one goes out on the other. Uh, doesn't do any major processing. Uh, the default payload, which I'm going to touch in a second, would be the POJO. So this would actually, uh, whatever the greeter uh, impl has as far as its, uh, whatever its signature says. So if it's like a say hi object or whatever, a person object or whatever, it would actually, that's what would be on the, this, the camel exchange uh, in the middle of those two. Uh, thus, if your route is doing more than just a from to and you're dealing with something in the middle there, you're going to get a whatever the, the JAXB based object. Or uh, the nice thing about CXF is we also, also have data, other data bindings. So if, you ha if your greeter interface there has the at data binding uh, XML beans, it would be an XML bean object, not a. Uh, not a JAXB object, but let's see. So uh, I'm going to talk briefly about the CXF data formats because it's kind of important from a, particularly from a performance standpoint, but also what you're going to get at in the next sections of your routes. Um, POJO, which is the default, uh, again, as I mentioned, CX, by default with CXF, I mean, CXF is designed to, to you take the, the XML in, we do some arm marshalling into objects, and that's what we hand into your, your endpoint. Uh, so POJO is basically that. Uh, the default would be JAXWIZ or JAXB because that's what JAXWIZ defines as the default. Um, but there are annotations and configuration that you can say XML beans and a lot of that stuff can depend on, on what your um, what you've used as far as your like WSL Java tool, like which, what flags you've passed and, and things like that. So or if you're doing Java first, in which case you have existing things. Um, so that's again. That just means CXF will handle everything. Uh, the XML come in, we'll process the SOAP parts, we'll unmarshal the, the body into these objects, and then by the time we get out of CXF and into the camel space, uh, those are the, the, the objects, the same as what you would have if you were doing a pure CXF thing. Um, the other, the next thing that, at the extreme opposite end of the spectrum, is the Message or raw. Uh, it used to be called message, but there's reason to, to kind of deprecate that a little bit, so we've kind of alias to raw for right now. Um, and that's very similar to the very low level components that I mentioned earlier. When it gets out of CXF and into CAMEL, it's going to be a byte string. See, in, this, in the raw slash message uh, payload or data format things, CXF does almost no processing. It will not do any XML processing. It won't look at the SOAP envelope. It won't do the look at the SOAP body. It, does, I mean, it really strips out almost all of the CXF capabilities. The, the, it, to basically through a point where it looks like the uh, like Camel Jetty component, where you're just kind of getting byte arrays and stuff like that. So the question is, OK, why would you have that? Um, one thing that I mentioned earlier was the whistle generation. Uh, if you want to deal with like the stream-based stuff, but you still want CXF to handle things like uh, the question mark WSDL, uh, and when you start dealing with, with REST, the question mark WADL, or under, underscore WADL. Um, so there are certain things like that that you may want, you still may want CXF to generate for you, but from a camel standpoint, you still just want the stream of bytes. So there are things uh, you can do like that. The big thing is, it, because you're, again, you're just dealing with the stream of bytes, that's your highest performance option is, right, is that one right there uh, for most for the most case part. Uh, payload, um, it's kind of like the POJO without the actually creating the JAXB objects. Uh, if you're dealing with, the, like this was like a pure CXF application, this would be the equivalent of passing the uh, source data binding into the WSL to Java tool, where it would generate, uh, instead of generating JAXB things, it just, uh, in the generated code, it just does a like DOM source or a stream source or something like that. And that's what you would, uh, CXF will pass to you. Uh, this is kind of like in between the POJO and the, and the RAW, uh, in that you actually get XML uh, as a source. And by default, with, with starting in 293, I think, of CAMEL, it would be a stack source uh, if stacks is enabled. 
uh, which so at least still allows some level of streaming uh, because with stacks you can kind of get the events off there and it, it basically kind of wrappers the input stream with the stack source. So uh, CXF will have processed all the soapy stuff so it's just, just the, the body coming in. Uh, if for some reason while processing the soap stuff it has to break that streaming, it will. Obviously like WS Security, we have to read the whole thing in so we can do the signatures and stuff. So. Again, that's all, all kind of hidden under the covers by CXF. Um, by the time it gets to the route, you just got XML the body. Now, the, the problem we had uh, in 2.9 uh, and earlier was that those were the only three options we had. Uh, what if you wanted to have CXF actually process the SOAP stuff, but you still wanted the entire message? There wasn't an option to do that with prior versions uh, of CAMEL. So uh, one of the things that we added was the CXF message mode, which kind of sits between the payload and, and the raw message in that uh, CX, it doesn't remove all the interceptors like it's in the, in the, the raw mode. So all of C CXF will still do the WSRM processing. It'll still do the WS security processing, stuff like that. But what you, what you get in your camel route then is the kind of post-processed full message. So if you have headers in your XML, uh, your SOAP headers in, in your SOAP message, they'll still be going through. Uh, but it's post-processing. Post um, so like your username token will still be there, but if it was originally encrypted on the wire, by the time you get in the camel, it will be decrypted because CXF will have done that. Um, a lot of good things, a lot of bad things. I, it's a great idea that there's a problem right now and that there's some restrictions inside of CXF that makes us have to pull the entire message into basically an SAJ model in order to do this. Um, so there are def definitely performance impact of it right now. Uh, I'm hoping as part of either uh, a future version of CXF to be able to fix some of those issues and then go back to fix the camel issues so that we can continue to stream it rather than having to pull everything in. So like I said, for, for the most, ti most times when you're dealing with a CXF message as opposed to the, the raw message, you're going to need the whole thing in anyway because things like WS security is going to need to process the whole message. So the impact is less, um, but there is an impact there. So something to keep in mind right now. <clears throat> All right, so that pretty much covers most of the SOAP things. Um, actually, I'm going to stop right there. Are there any questions about anything that far? Might as well stop and ask. Nope. All right. So then we go into the other category of web services, which would be REST. Uh, right now in Camel, you have, I, in addition to the low-level things, I, with those low-level things I talked about earlier, you can do posts, you can do gets, you can kind of do your puts and your deletes and everything, doing all the low level things. So and you can do it, it's just gonna be a little bit more difficult because you're gonna to have to start adding extra like question mark flags to say what method you're gonna be dealing with and, and things like that. Um, we have, there are two components right now in Camel to kind of make that a little bit easier. Uh, the first one is the Camel Restlet. Uh, this is basically an example here where you're gonna expose a REST-based service on 8080 users ID basic. Uh, it's gonna start a process or a route that then goes into this processor. And RESTlet will take a look at that URL up there, notice the brackets, uh, and depending on the URL coming in, we'll, we'll find out that ID is in that group there and it will create a uh, header in the exchange to actually uh, represent that and you can kind of manipulate things that way. So you don't have to do all the URL parsing to figure out, okay, where is the ID in there? Restlet does that for you. Um, so like this is actually, again, on the, same, on the, same, on the producer side. Um, so if we send this, it would trigger that, and this 1.123 would be the ID going into your, your service. Uh, and again, it'll kind of handle it. And there's, Restlet has a whole bunch of different, like you can put different types of brackets and there's path params and whether, like whether it's like a question mark type param or a this is a path param. Um, again, it just kind of makes it a little bit easier so you don't need to be tearing apart the URL. Restlet will do it for you. Uh, makes it a little bit more convenient but still not, uh, if you're kind of a Java first type shop, you're still, it's still a little bit more complicated. Uh, the other option is the Camel CXF component again. I mean, this is another thing. Camel CXF component has gotten really big, um, and I, one of the things that we want to do for probably 3.0 is split it 
Uh, I know on the CXF side, we've already kind of pulled various parts of, of the JAXRS implementation into separate jars. We're probably going to do the same thing here and have a, a separate Camel JAXRS based thing as opposed to the Camel CXF JAXRS as opposed to Camel CXF JAXWiz or something like that. But right now, it's in the same thing. Uh, the, the big power here, because it's JAXRS based, uh, are you all familiar with JAXRS? I should probably ask that. Um, uh, for those of you who are not, uh, it's basically a specification for um, uh, how to map uh, your URLs and, and REST requests coming in to methods on a service object. Uh, CXF extends that spec a little bit by allowing you to just have those annotations on an interface. And then you can kind of, and with Camel, you can kind of just use that interface to define what your REST methods are. And that's basically what this is showing, is you have uh, a Java interface with the various annotations. So uh, you can have multiple methods there. Uh, you can say get to that URL, uh, we'll call that method, and, and a put to that, we'll call that. And um, you can kind of, when you create your endpoint then with the, the Camel CXF, you just kind of pass that class name in, uh, and the CXF internally will does a lot of things. One thing, it'll, it'll generate the Waddle document. For any of you that don't know what a Waddle document is, it's basically the REST equivalent of a WSDL. Um, so it kind of describes what your REST services has. Like is, it'll say your REST service has these three these methods. Uh, these are the paths to those methods. It's expecting a delete for that method and a put for that method and the various types. So it, it's like pretty much like a WSDL for, for, for REST. Um, so it'll do that based on that interface. Uh, and it'll map, it'll talk, in this case, because it's uh, using CXF's internal jetty, it would bring up the jetty port with the, the right paths and stuff like that. So anything that comes in, uh, you can then start a process. And, and again, uh, you can kind of start pulling things out of the exchange and the in message and then do some various processing based on what you see there. Uh, in this case, uh, because you don't actually have a real object, it's all defined by an interface, it kind of puts tears all that stuff apart into information in the end message, and then you can, in your processor, you're, you can kind of do various things based on that. And in this case, it, if it's the update customer method, uh, CXF will have, based on the update customer method, will have already pulled the data, which is from a put, in, and parsed it into a customer object, and that's what will be in your exchange. So you don't need to do any parsing, you'll get the object, just like, like you found it. So that's, just kind of makes it make the, the rest stuff a little bit easier if you're trying to do rest stuff. So then there's the, okay, if all else fails and you really don't want to use any of those components, there's the old standby of Camel Bean. Camel Bean, you can pretty much do anything you want. Uh, and you can kind of create your own little Java Bean. Uh, you can use CXF generated code. You can use Access2 generated code. You can, uh, I, if you have code that actually uses a HTTP URL connection to do a put uh, or something like that. You can kind of create your own little bean. Uh, and as part of your route, you can call a method on your bean. Um, very simple. I'm, in, it, in a lot of cases, it works. I mean, if you have code already as part of your application someplace that does something like that, uh, this may actually be the easiest option. Uh, why cr like duplicate a lot of work that you've done to optimize a certain interaction uh, when you can just Call your bean. Uh, it's simple and easy. So that's my, if all else fails, it's there for you. Uh, not something I, I strongly encourage, but it is something that you should be aware of to, to think about. Uh, so that's pretty much uh, all the various options that I'm aware of. There's probably about another dozen options out there in the ether of the internet someplace. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there's, these are the stuff that's kind of built into to the camel SVN repository as it is today. Uh, and uh, obviously, as time goes on, technology changes. We'll probably be adjusting some of these. I mean, the, the Camel 3 discussions are going to cause some of these things to change a little bit. Um, but that's, that's pretty much there. Uh, if you need more information, again, go to uh, the Camel website. Uh, there's the components button on the right. All the components are there. Uh, if you have a problem, there's probably a component there that will help you. Um, and then there's my contact information if you need it. So any questions or comments? Yeah? Was there any uh, 
like JSON handling? So I see a lot of XML handling, but like JSON is the body. Uh, for the REST components, yeah. I mean, both, uh, like the REST easy and, and uh, yeah, not REST easy, but the, the RESTlet and the CXF components. Uh, specifically for CXF, because CXF being JAXRS based, uh, you have a bunch of uh, JAXRS providers. And like even like Jackson provides a standard uh, JAXRS provider that you can just plug into your JAXRS implementation to do that. So if your uh, interface that you wrote there has an app produces application JSON or app consumes JSON, uh, CXF will call off to the right provider that you've had registered. Now, that said, again, it gets into some of the complexi complexity of CXF and then you'd have to figure out how to register those producers with CXF and that involves like spring config or blueprint config or something like that. Um, but uh, again, it, it's with, CX, with, with both of those, they, they can kind of handle it depending on how you have your annotations and configuration um, and what's available. Uh, again, with, with like CXF, we have the option to use Jettison or Jackson or a couple of others and, and things like that. So depends on what you configure. Any other questions or comments? Nope. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it was great to that everybody stuck around to the end. I mean, <laughs> we're, this is the, the end of the sessions now, so I'm assuming that means we have a break and then probably all of our final keynotes and stuff. So.